thank you for being there today. We have a long AI day about training, about inference, about fine tuning. On my side, I come from an industrial sector. And for me, I find it really important to, to always, always talk, sorry, about raw material. And for digital, raw material is hardware. And this is what we are going to talk about today. And there are many concerns about hardware. Most of it will be the, the sorry, environment, it will be accessibility, and it will be sovereignty. And so we have an amazing panel today to talk about all these topics. The first one I want to talk about is maybe what the difference between training, fine tuning, and inference. We are today at the beginning of the AI journey. For the moment, it's mostly about training, about the marvelous ideas that everyone has. But then we will have people using AI that will mostly go to fine tuning and then have a topic about inference. And for the first topic, I would like, it for, I would like Mark, if you agree, to talk to us about your vision on this. Sure, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Armstrong. I'm uh, the uh, VP responsible for uh, HPC and AI across Europe, Middle Africa for, uh, for HPE. So, I mean, yeah, that's a really interesting, a really interesting question. And, uh, you know, HPE uh, are deeply involved in um, supporting our customers and our, and our partners at the moment around all of those aspects, but uh, particularly training right now. Um, and that uh, that plays to a lot of HPE's heritage. You know, when you look at the the problem statement around training, um, this this is a huge workload that needs mass parallelization, and uh, that's exactly what HPE's been doing in the supercompute world for 50 plus years. So so it's huge at scale compute, um, and um, you know we are. At the, at the forefront of that of that industry, I mean, we, we it was announced at uh, Supercompute this week that HPE have the top three three of the top five supercomputers in the world, and we take that technology and use the experience of um, optimizing the performance at that level, and intellectual property and software, and bring that into this new world um, of, of AI training, and, and we do that at massive scale. So, um, you know, it's something that we're very used to doing, and we've got a, um, a huge amount of, um, of, uh, of customers at the moment that we're, that we're working on for uh, training huge foundation models. But then equally, um, you know, the market we see moving um, very, very fast towards inference, and um, what a huge opportunity that is. I mean, when, when, when I think about that, inference is really the outcome of the foundation models. It's the business outcome. Um, and we are at uh, the very, very early stages of, of that um, um, in terms of you know, the applications that are going to create the demand for, for inference. And HPE, again, in that space is, um, you know, is very focused on optimizing technology uh, to create the most best outcomes, the most efficient outcomes for our, for our customers in in many different ways, and I'll talk a little bit more about that I, I think as we go through the the, the, the talk. But uh, you know, HP is very very central um, at the moment to this whole this whole new emerging H AI AI space. Thank you. And Philip, I know your first CPU is more focused on HPC, but can you tell us more about what you're going to do in inference? There is a lot more to, uh, to say. Thanks for this. So first, to introduce Cyperl, we are the European company developing a high-performance microprocessor. Uh, this has been discussed this morning, but we want uh, the Julish Jupiter machine will be the CPU that will, uh, will fuel it to be deployed in 2025. That's probably the first time a European company has been able to beat a bit American player on this area, and also for ARM to beat x86, the, the legacy, uh, legacy solution. Now, the way we have developed this, uh, this solution, it's with lots, lots of embedded core, so ARM, uh, ARM V1, and also lots of embedded memory, so-called HBM, so high bandwidth memory, which is directly within the package. So it means that we can deploy lots of embedded computing without talking to the external DDR5, DDR5 which is usually very consuming. And uh, a couple, uh, let's say a couple months ago, when uh, ChatGPT and everything related to inf inference AI started to, to boom everywhere, I pushed my guys to tweak a bit the architecture and to see how competitive we could be on inference AI. And now I'm quite happy to say that with the when you have, let's say, more than 64 gigabytes of embedded memory within one chip and that you can manage terabytes 
of data throughput in between cores and between embedded memory, yes, we are fine for inference AI because we can, st we can store a full inference model within the chip, which means that the, in terms of computing efficiency, when you are not talking to DDR5, we can have some very, very interesting uh, power figures. So it, for us, it's a, it's a go for inference AI. Great to know. And when we talk about this, when we talk about inference, we talk about the fact that hardware is going to be changed. For now, we have a hardware which is very dense, very complex, very highly connected in one place. And then with inference, we have the topic of being more, much more distributed infrastructure. What I'd like to know, uh, maybe beginning by DDN, James, is that we know that everything goes with data, a lot of data, and when we talk about infrastructure distributed, how does it go for data? Yeah, um, this is like a, a little panel about hardware, so let me talk about that a, a little bit. So we are a, a storage company, so I am interested in the CPUs and GPUs, and congratulations, by the way, on your new CPU. Um, but of course, we're really interested in storage systems. Now, what's a storage system? It's really just a computer. It's got some flash, it's got a network, a CPU. Uh, it's just the shape of that storage, co that computer is designed to put data and get data from more than anything else. Um, and as we see data become more distributed, and particularly inference going to the edge, that means we need different shaped uh, storage computers to manage that stuff. So in telcos, close to your mobile devices, um, very low latency using 5G and then 6G, we need to have these hardware pieces that are very small, very compact, very low power, and still very fast. And we're seeing, you know, by the way, we're seeing a, a bunch of different vendors coming up with DPUs, data processing units, and it's like, uh, it's just a computer on a chip, really, but it adds in a network, adds in the capability of adding in storage, uh, and has CPU, because you always need a CPU somewhere. So we see a lot of DPUs in the world driving uh, inference at the edge. And then at the core and in the cloud, we kind of need the opposite. We need very, very scalable, large-scale storage systems that are going to be optimized for maximum performance, maximum throughput, maximum IOPS. Because as we've seen this past year, the critical thing is kind of efficiency. It's very hard to get 10,000 GPUs or whatever it might be. They're very rare, very scarce, and they're very expensive. So there, the key for storage is how can you keep it all running at maximum efficiency? And the worst thing storage can do is make everything wait and burn, burn uh, energy and burn your capital costs. So I see the world of storage around AI really diversifying. So bigger things get bigger and the littler things get littler. And on this thing about being littler and the power usage that you just talked about, can you, Philip, talk to us about what you are going to do on the design of the chips? Yes, this is also a complex topi topic for this who are, who are used to talk about nanometer. Uh, now, most of the industry for compute is moving beyond three nanometer, so it means that you just have a couple, let's say, atoms per transistor, so which in the way of designing the chip is even, even more complex. For a third generation, so the one that will be in, uh, in Germany on Jupiter machine, we have embedded more than 60 billion transistors, not talking about the, the memory. For the next one, in three nanometer, will be let's say, more than 100 billion transistors. Uh, which gives you an idea of the, the density of compute you can have within uh, within one chip. And you are talking about sovereignty earlier on. It's also a good way, no comment for the, let's say, US authorities to control the export. Because when you're they are talking now, in terms of export law, about a computing density per square millimeter. So if you are beyond a specific threshold, you cannot sell to a countries like uh, like China, for instance, if you are below this threshold, it's uh, uh, it's okay. But the lessons behind is that we are going to much more integration. Uh, when you're moving to deep node process, so beyond three nanometer, you consume far less per transistor. And for the experts, when you are, s let's say, for such a design, when we are talking about a switch, so it means that a transistor which is switching, or a gate which is switching from zero to one, or one to zero, in terms of energy, we are talking about picojoules per switch. And when you have 100 billion transistor on one ship and you're switching 3, 000, let's say 3 billion times or 4 billion times a second, so the level of quantity you have to manage is huge. In two years, we'll talk, let's say, about something like more than 1,500 watts per chip. So it means that for, let's say, cloud or like scaleway, it's lots of energy to manage. Uh, for us, designing the chip, it's to manage all the supply to, 
to supply the, to the chips, so there's still uh, a lot to do, but that's definitely where everybody on Cyperl uh, is, is going. Thank you. And talking about this, we talk about storage, we talk about chips, but there is infrastructure over it, servers, anyway, we will need this. How HPE is going to, to go on this? Well, I mean, um, y you know, in terms of um, in terms of sustainability, it's um, it's a it's a really really important um, thing for us to to be doing and to designing into our systems. Uh, you know, again, when you look at some of the core challenges around designing and architecting high performance compute, uh, either in the training space or, you know, or the inference space, um, you know, power, cooling. Um, scale are all critical aspects, and um, to be able to cool these things uh, is um, a major M and E challenge, and one that we put an awful lot of time time into. Um, and to that extent, um, you know, we have the greenest technology on the planet when you look at supercomputing. The top three greenest um, computers in the world are HPE computers, and the reason for that is the way that we. Um, model out the design, the cooling, um, and optimize the performance of the technology that's in those that this, that's in those supercomputers. And again, you know, you think about what those some super supercomputers do, um, and the sustainability outcomes that they create. And again, it's 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 uh, it's really fascinating. And then you know, in the in the inference space, um, and in the you know in the more standardized um, AI modeling space. Again, you know, we put an awful lot of intellectual property into designing systems um, that create um, highly efficient um, um, power outcomes. Um, in fact, you know, our, our, our most up, uh, modern or, or um, um, most recent um, system, um, which we operate with the H100s, the, the, uh, the DX 6500, that operates at Bet at least 40% um, of the power efficiency of uh, the DGX systems themselves. So, you know, we, we can gain huge energy efficiency uh, from the um, the knowledge and the, and the way that we put these things together. Um, and when you think about that in terms of sustainability, um, when we're talking about coupling together thousands and thousands of, of H100s in one place, to do one to do one training um, 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 workload, that's a major major impact both in terms of cost and uh, and electricity. So uh, yeah, I mean that's our opinion on that. Thank you. And Jean, maybe you could talk to us about how quantum is going to go in AI in this topic. That you have the same thing as GPU. It's imagined as quantum is big, bulky, hyper infrastructure. How do you go to inference, or how does it go we go to from quantum to AI now? So um, yes, so it's it's clear that the system are uh, big, bulky. So just for first um, uh, word on Candela. So it's we we are not very known in the AI world because we are quantum. So we are doing quantum computer quantum computer with uh, single photon. So the quantum particle that we are using to make computation is one single photon. So something that has one attojoule of energy. And we are computing with this uh, level of, uh, of uh, particle. So see these systems are very rare in the world, not only photonic, but there is a lot of other system quantum systems. They are very rare. Uh, there is less than 100 systems in the world that are available online. And um, we are trying to, uh, to, to make that available. And it's one of the things that we are really trying to do. And one thing we, we did and we announced today was also to make available um, the quantum as a service at Scaleway, uh, because these systems that are super rare, we, we need to make them available so that people can start uh, learning and doing things in with them. So quantum and AI, so first thing we need to know is that there is a promise in uh, quantum that uh, uh, com that quantum will come with a kind of unprecedented, unprecedented uh, computing power. Uh, it's so doesn't doesn't mean that we'll be doing things that we do today faster, but it will be doing things that we cannot do, uh, basically. So there is a real shift of paradigm here, and uh, um, there is a real uh, match with AI for two reasons. First, because uh, there is already some evidence on the systems that are available today which with relatively small scale that um, quantum can boost AI. And just to give some idea and uh, order of magnitude, uh, with 20 qubits, 20 photonic qubits, we are manipulating a space, a computing space that is bigger than ChatGPT with 20 photonic qubits. So we have a, a totally different paradigm where 
AI ob obviously <laughs> needs to go because uh, we are also manipulating this huge space. And there is another reason why to go to AI now with um, uh, to quantum now with AI is that we are kind of lucky today that all the system quantum system available on the in the world today can be simulated simulated with classical AI. And which is an opportunity because we are developing for the moment system that we can simulate. So we are using AI to develop algorithm and at the same time to, to improve the design of the quantum chips. And we know that this won't hold for a long time because in two, three years, uh, the classical computing power will not be enough to simulate uh, quantum. So quantum will be on its own. So for the moment, it's important that quantum and AI uh, play together. Thank you very much. Mark was talking about this, and you talked about this too, about power. I have a real bad moment for me. It's like pronouncing a Dutch name. So please, I'm sorry if someone is Dutch here. Alex de Vries <laughs> from Amsterdam, from the uh, School of Business and Economics, just published an article about the power consumption of AI. As it seems, in 2027, AI will consume as much power as Sweden or Netherlands. So it makes it like a country of the G20 in terms of power consumption. Nothing to say more. I think we understand the issue for everyone. <laughs> James, can you tell us more? Because of course, there is a lot of storage and storage will use a lot of power too. Yeah, um, so we do talk about this a lot with customers, um, but it's not quite the story you might expect uh, because you know CPUs and, and GPUs are the power hungry things. Um, drives aren't really in the same scale. Um, so in a data center, the storage system is probably going to consume less than a twentieth of the overall power. But um, I kind of think Jensen Huang, who, is, uh, who started off this conference today, uh, he's got the right idea. In order to reduce our power consumption, we've got to do this thing which he calls accelerated computing, which really means integrating right across the whole stack. So we no longer have an application, a CPU, a network, uh, a, s a storage device, blah, blah. These things are hugely interconnected. So the application is talking in some way directly to the storage. The storage is talking in some way directly to the network. The net everything's transferring information to give you the absolute maximum optimization right through the stack. And we do this today, by the way. So about two years ago, NVIDIA came up with GPU Direct, allow us to RDMA, um, that means sort of magically fast move data uh, from storage into the GPU memory. And then there's other things we've done to connect into that stack to basically take away all the inefficiencies. And that's the easiest gain is huge integration up and down the stack so that we don't waste any of these cycles. And that's already given us like 10, 100, even 1,000x gains, especially at the application layer when the application starts talking directly to the individual hardware components. Uh, through open APIs, then th things can get hugely efficient. Uh, but it is, a, it is a big story. We've got to sort it out. And um, it is a little bit upsetting that AI is going to consume so much power. So I suppose the, the big uh, positive side, we might be able to resolve some of the problems associated with our energy consumption as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Jean, do you think that quantum AI can change? In this area? Uh, yes, definitely. So there's two things to know about uh, quantum is that it, the growth of power with uh, um, of, uh, computing power of quantum is exponential, meaning that when you have one system with 20 qubits, you add one qubit, you double the power of the system, uh, which is totally different than the classical system where we want to double the power. You put to a computer or you are a bit smart and you can be a bit better, but basically it's linear versus exponential. So here we have a gain. The second thing to know about quantum is that uh, quantum is, we are quantum. <laughs> Every particle of our, our body are quantum, but we are not quantum, we are not directed by the law of quantum because all the particles interact together and they are, they, they are making uh, the quantum state what you call decohere. So to keep a quantum state and to be able to make some quantum computation, we need to be absolutely sure that there is no decoherence, which means that the particle needs to be isolated from everything. And in that case, it means that it's the kind of en enemy of energy. If we have energy, we kind of uh, have quantum computing. It's kind of the, the two side. So the other way around, when we'll have a quantum computer, we'll have something that doesn't use a lot of energy. I just want to, because it's, it's always a bit complicated to talk about energy without trying to make some greenwashing, we need to be careful here because uh, first, uh, the, the energy cost, uh, the energy budget of a quantum computer is what I say, the core should not use energy, otherwise we are talking about atojoule. 
But at the same time, everything around will consume energy, and this, at the end, we need to be careful of what will be the part. But the core should not consume energy to, to be able to work as, as, um, as a quantum. So this uh, is, uh, is very important to, uh, to keep in mind when we are thinking about uh, that. And the second point we need to keep in mind is that with this unprecedented uh, computing power, there might be some rebound effect that uh, appears every time that we make some progress. People will use that computing power even more. So <laughs> maybe, it's, it's, but it's the more depending on how human will be using this new technology. Thank you. And uh, talking about linearity and not exponential, how does uh, CIPOL is going to manage uh, this uh, sustainable issue? So you're absolutely right. We, we have a problem. So one of the ways to, to solve it, I said, is that to move to deep node process, which means that the, the chips will have much more higher density of, of, of compute per chip, which means also that the chips will be much, much more expensive. So be ready in HPE, in DDN to afford the cost. But that's, uh, that's life. We have to, you have to pay for our development. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. Sorry for that. Uh, and if we take an analogy with what happened in the smartphone business, let's say, let's say for the past 10 years, the a smartphone can last something like one day on a battery. But also during the same period of time, the computing power you had, you have on a, a smartphone has been, let's say, multiplied by 10x, 20x, something like this, with Android getting more complex or much more application. Uh, so they, they be, let's say, the smartphone business has been able to successfully manage the, uh, the growth of computing power. So of course, the better technologies in terms of battery, uh, much more better chips to, uh, to compute. And as you said earlier on, so it's system level architecture, but it's also uh, new architecture within the chip. And uh, one of the way to do it, and I, I know that Scaleway is quite keen on it, and we're quite keen on it also, is in terms of new instruction set and work on ARM-based architecture, which is an ARM is coming from the smartphone, so battery management and uh, a good instruction set, and that's what we are doing, among others. And uh, your two sponsors today are also, let's say, quite quite arm centric. That's one of the uh, one of the solution. Talking about Scaleway announcement, we already, already uh, this morning talked about announcement about quantum. It's really another way of thinking AI, and I will be really interested to know what is go how quantum is going to revolutionize AI exactly. So we don't know everything yet, <laughs> but there is a lot of evidence that uh, this will bring uh, new things. Like, for instance, we call we we call that quantum embeddings. So embeddings, you are projecting data in a big space. Here we are talking about a huge, huge space that doesn't follow an, uh, any of the linear um, uh, rules of uh, transfer that you can get in a neural network. So here we have these quantum embeddings that could be something totally different that will bring a part. Uh, of a hybrid system where there will be GPU and, uh, and QP working together. There is also other evidence like uh, a boosting of the, um, of the convergence time. We see that uh, because and thanks to the parallel effect that we can do with quantum, we are able to explore far more the space when you are training a neural network and then get a gain in the convergence uh, speed um, in, um, in totally classical AI. So, um, not everything is proven yet and tested, but there is a lot of different perspectives where we can see that uh, quantum and uh, GPU, the GPU, will work together uh, to improve the, the algorithm that we have today. Jean is talking all the time about exponential, and we know we are consuming data. So if we, consuming d we are consuming data on an exponential way, how is DDN going to manage this? Oh. Uh, I guess sell more storage systems. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it has been exponential for a long time. I mean, I've been at my company for 12 years, and that curve of data growth rate has been exponential. There's no change. Um, fortunately, um, with the advent of Flash, we've hit like a, you know, like the Moore's Law in CPU. Um, we kind of, uh, with HDD, traditional HDD technology, we kind of just about hit the buffers there. We're kind of, every year we get another two terabytes, two terabytes, two terabytes, and it grows like this. Whereas Flash is doubling. Um, so right now we've got 60 terabyte flash devices, and the next year we'll have 120 f terabyte flash devices. So for the for the short term, at least, we're on a, a very strong ex exponential curve in terms of uh, the density of data we can store at reasonably low low cost and low power uh, in these systems. So I guess long may that continue. Of course, um, we do have uh, just like quantum's coming to potentially revolutionise AI. There are other technologies in storage which might revolutionize our world. Um, there's new organic 
uh, storage chips, for example, which are going to bring higher density potentially. Um, it's a little bit far out, but I think we have maybe a good uh, three, four years of speculative of continued reasonably exponential growth in the flash. Okay, thank you. And HPE, we know we are. You are always working on the next generation. What is happening on your side, l looking at quantum? Well, I mean, um, you know, for us, the next generation is is you know continuing to create the world's um, fastest supercomputers um, at the very top end. But it's also about democratizing that and bringing the expertise that we have and the intellectual property that we have at the very top of the market into the into the general market so uh, you know you're seeing um, you're seeing innovations from HPE such as um, slingshots a good example slingshot is the network fabric that manages these um, you know millions and millions of cores that are in supercomputers it manages the performance of the network to optimize the uh, t to the overall throughput that technology we're bringing into our core kind of proliant range and you know again when you think about Moore's law, you think about the perfo how performance will grow over time and how fast it's grown already. Um, you know, you need innovations like that in core technology to enable the things that are going to need to get done to be done in, in you know, in, in a more general space. So, you know, for us, it's about it's about driving innovation from the top down. It's also about developing software tooling that increases the efficiency of the system. Um, because again, you know, if you think about the capital cost of this, um, you know, a supercomputer at the top will cost 200, 400, 600 million, million dollars, euros. Uh, uh, with um, optimization, um, with software tooling, optimization around expertise in, in, um, in managing the application performance with the technology, you can increase the efficiency of a system by 10, 20, 20%. 20 and and you know, 10% of 600 is a lot of money and a lot of a lot of capital efficiency, um, and a lot of extra things that you could you could do with that technology. So you know, we're about optimizing um, you know optimizing this architecture um, to enable customers to get the most value out of it. And, and on Cypher side, Jean was talking about the fact that we will have a, uh, an association of GPU and quantum in the future. How do you see this at Cypher? Yeah, very good point. In fact, uh, we, we, we see quantum as an accelerator. So for us, interfacing with a quantum computer or quantum accelerator, it's equivalent to interfacing with uh, any kind of uh, accelerator. Uh, part of the, not the hype, but let's say the quantum uh, processing, the, the big boom was something like two years ago when it was a global awareness that quantum will be everywhere. And it's, it's still in and it's, uh, uh, it's fair, but it's going to be surrounded by standard, standard computing, standard chips, which is so good for my business. Uh, so the, the, int the interfaces uh, exist, there are multiple, uh, let's say PCI, CXL, or plenty of standards which, uh, which arrive to do this, uh, uh, this kind of interconnect. But the way I see the, let's say, big HPC or even HPC for AI, it's going to be heterogeneous. So you have multiple forms of acceleration, depending on the workload they will have. You will have clusters of CPU, and that's what, for instance, happened in, uh, in Germany. Uh, what we will see also, and this, unfortunately, for, for us in Europe, this happens in the, in the GAFAM in US. They can develop their own chips, which are really targeted for their own need in terms of TPU or DPU or something like this. So in Europe, it's a bit more complex because we don't have cloud or it's per scale at this level of scale that can afford such, um, such a design, but we are, let's say, happy to, uh, happy to help them. Uh, and what you will see also in terms of uh, architecture and to go back to the energy savings. So for the machine learning, the big heavy, heavy machine, it's clear that NVIDIA is far uh, ahead of this, but in terms of inference, which is part of the, part of the deal, because it's not only a question of uh, building the model after you need to uh, you need to use it and for this you will see much more and more chips which are really dedicated for uh, for inferences and there are, let's say a couple candidates for is for, for this including us thank you so thank you uh, for the four of you to give us all this information we are very proud of scaleway to work with all of you <laughs> and this is great to see this maybe before closing this panel we could have a word from each of you about this future inference quantum sustainability what is your last last word vision about this uh, my last word would be just uh, an anecdote i was uh, I, I was lucky to work in ai in uh, natural language processing in 2016 when the paper 
uh, from Google, uh, transfer, uh, attention is all you need appeared. So my engineer came immediately and said, what should we do? Should we try to do it? And uh, we did. And immediately it works. And I saw, I see, I see exactly the same effect today. There was something we knew that AI was to become something big with natural language processing. And <laughs> ChatGPT is the proof today. And we are at the same stage in quantum today. We have small system. We know that there is something. There is missing the lit little thing that will go ahead, but we should work on that. And my point is that it's time to, to start. I'd like to, to conclude a different way because you started with sovereignty. I'd like to conclude on, on sovereignty right. myself. Uh, 20 years ago in Europe, they completely missed the, let's say, the web business, the cloud business. You see where in which position are the GAFAM today. Now for AI and also semiconductor, if we don't want to miss the second chance, we have to do it now and do it, do it quickly. If not, it's going to be, let's say, US, US tech everywhere again. And we, you got a, a good demo this, uh, this morning. Um, I, I guess my last comment would be, you know, um, um, Sam, it sounds maybe a bit trite, but, um, you know, AI is absolutely changing the world and it's changing um, the, the way that we will live and, and that we will work. And there's no doubt that we're, r I think, right at the beginning of, um, of, of enjoying the benefits and the outcomes of this. Um, and, um, um, you know, as I say, you know, w when you go when you go from training to inference, you're really g you're going to where you make a difference in society, where you make a difference to people, um, and I think we're right at the beginning of that journey. So, you know, just um, incredibly excited to see that. Um, um, very lucky and privileged to be a part of that journey. I mean, it's been amazing today actually seeing and talking to some of the application providers, because again, to me, that's where the outcomes are made from, 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 from this stuff, um, and where you start making a difference to the consumer and to the user. Um, so yeah, just in incredibly excited to be part of it, um, and looking forward to the road ahead. Yep, nothing to disagree with there. Uh, I mean, I'm in life for having fun, and this sort of uh, AI revolution we've been going through the past few years is really fun, especially in the industry. So it's been very exciting, um, kind of surprising at times, and that's uh, that's what I'm here for. And now with quantum coming along, I did a, a, a PhD in quantum physics about 30 years ago, so I'm kind of looking forward to be able to talk about that stuff again, uh, and hope hope it comes to fruition in the next couple of years. Thank you very much. We can impose, I think. <laughs>